There has, since Julian's arrest uh, in April of 2019, um, been actually a change in the narrative in the mainstream media and amongst mainstream human rights groups and press groups, in that there's actually a consensus now. Um, everyone's able to sort of get beyond, you know, maybe personal differences, you know, if they work together and that kind of thing. But there's, there's consensus amongst all the leading groups, all the leading newspapers, all the press freedom groups, that these charges are outrageous and that this poses the gravest threat to press freedom, arguably of our lifetimes. So whether that's Amnesty, Human Rights Watch, the ACLU, uh, Freedom of Press Foundation, you know, various UN special rapporteurs, as Brian mentioned, um, you know, there have been uh, editorials from the New York Times, The Guardian, um, and even Alan Rusbridger from The Guardian said, you know, I had my bumps on the road with Julian, you know, definitely had problems, but I absolutely am against these charges. And this is not about him. This is about what this means to the press globally. Um, so I think that's a really, really welcome development. We've also seen from The Guardian just in the last few days, a really powerful uh, couple of stories um, from somebody that I hadn't heard from before, who was the um, Reuters bureau chief um, around the time of the collateral murder video, which uh, I'm sure most people on this call know that Chelsea Manning um, had seen that video and was horrified by the uh, murder of Iraqi civilians and two Reuters journalists, and out of sort of her moral conscience, sought to um, make those documents public through WikiLeaks. Now, the Iraqi um, bureau chief from Reuters, Dean Yates, um, just did a couple of really powerful pieces in The Guardian Australia, and I think it's really worth looking at that story and looking at as Brian was saying, what were the lies that were covered up? Um, and basically Reuters had been shown, I think a little bit of the video and Reuters had asked to see the full video, they weren't. Um, and the video is really a sort of an incredible historical document um, because you, you see these, these US gunmen basically laughing when they're blowing up um, these rescue workers, when they're murdering these civilians and journalists. It made me think of, you know, these uprisings we're seeing around the world today around state violence against black people in America and the kind of smirk of that, that, um, that cop in Minneapolis, the smirk as he held down George Floyd. And it just reminded me of the laughter that we heard in that collateral murder video. And I personally feel that there's a connection to be drawn with looking for transparency and accountability with US state violence in the US against black and brown people and journalists as we've seen in these riots and US state violence around the world with black and brown people and journalists. So I think there's a, there's a connection to be drawn and as Brian said, this is about transparency and accountability and truth. And just to remind you what this case is actually about, um, people try to complicate it because it's, it's convenient to complicate it, but it's actually quite simple. It's not about 2016. It's not about Sweden. It's quite simply about the 2010 Iraq and Afghanistan war logs and the State Department cables. And incredibly embarrassing for the US and it brought out a lot of war crimes. And WikiLeaks, in coordination with other global media outlets like the New York Times and Der Spiegel and others, published these. And these were hugely historic and impactful events, um, arguably led to the withdrawal of troops from Iraq, because Iraq said, we're not going to give immunity to US troops anymore. So the question is, um, do we want to live in a culture where we can fight for transparency and accountability? Or do we want to make it okay to persecute the publishers who work on these materials. Chelsea was in, imprisoned. They're trying to give Julian life in prison. Um, and, you know, this is a watershed moment. You know, are we going to sit back and sit this out or are we going to show up and realize that if they do this to Julian, they're going to do this to journalists around the world? So I think it's an extraordinary opportunity for folks like folks on this call to sort of stand up and get engaged. 
um, and see what can be done ahead of September 7th, which is when the extradition hearing will be in London. The US establishment, you know, they will go to any extent to suppress anyone who tries to expose their war crimes. And so how important were the WikiLeaks stories to our understanding of the Afghan and the Iraq wars? Well, I think, um, again, I would refer you to look at Dean Yates's story in The Guardian the other day. Again, he's the Reuters bureau chief. But really, you know, Chelsea Manning's bravery in letting those Iraq and Afghanistan war logs and the collateral murder video come out really just showed how many lies there were, how much cover up there was as with every war. And it led to the Iraqis saying that they wouldn't allow US soldiers to have immunity for what they were doing in Iraq. And it led to the withdrawal of troops. So it had a real impact. And if you just Google the number of stories that there were from every major media outlet, it got so much coverage, not only Iraq and Afghanistan, but the whole world. I've worked on a number of projects also about Latin America, where what the cables revealed about, you know, relations between countries, you know, old business of the US interfering in Latin America, so much was revealed. So um, it makes you think of key moments in the Vietnam War when, when there were revelations about atrocities um, and that turned the tide and the conversation with Vietnam. Um, so, it, you know, it's a huge, huge service and there's, there's a lot of sort of films and documentaries you can look about it and I sort of encourage everyone to do that. Could the panelists suggest how we could push through the media blackout on the facts of the Assange case? And the second part of the question is, what could be done to make this more mainstream? And how could the panelists contribute to doing that ahead of uh, September 7th? Um, Susie, do you want to go first? Yeah. Um, uh, yeah, you, you tell us. <laughs> yeah, I would urge yeah. everyone, I would urge everyone <laughs> to write some suggestions in the comments, to be honest, because I'm sure we've got an amazing audience of people around the world. Yeah. So I'm going to give my humble ideas, but I actually am going to ask you all to put your ideas and I'm sure there'll be some eccentric ones but um, I'll give you my two cents. I think one is reminding people that there is an amazing opportunity right now and there's been some great journalism done. Um, there's an investigative journalism outlet in the UK called Declassified. They did some amazing coverage of the hearings thus far around the extradition and they found some really glaring and egregious conflicts of interest of people involved in the case in the UK. Um, really like if that had been picked up by the mainstream media that would have had huge impacts. So all to say we have the opportunity to amplify the journalism that's being done. We have an opportunity to share journalism that's being done by, by The Guardian, like The Guardian Australia in recent days around Dean Yates, for example, and to remind folks that this is, there's a lot to be covered and there's a lot of sort of opportunities to bring back focus to what this case is really about. Um, we can remind people that, you know, when Bernie was asked in the debates, I think, you know, would you prosecute under the Espionage Act? He said no. And we can remind people that the Obama Department of Justice, um, who was no friend to whistleblowers and was highly litigious, um, but even the Obama Department of Justice was not able to prosecute WikiLeaks. And so it is the Trump DOJ that is doing this. So to remind people, no matter your feelings on Assange, that if you are supporting this prosecution and this extradition request, you are supporting the Trump Department of Justice and you could be asking Biden to pledge not to prosecute. Um, I think in the UK, we can draw some attention to the fact that even Boris Johnson has said that the extradition treaty between the US and the UK um, is worth looking into and it's probably lopsided. Uh, Jeremy Corbyn, I think, asked him a question in Parliament a few months ago, like in February, regarding to an, another case. And Boris Johnson, himself formerly a journalist, um, said, you know what, it's, it's worth looking into and this seems like it's a lopsided agreement because the US always seems to be sending pe people that way but not the other way. Um, so there's a lot to dig into. Um, 
it's it's there's a lot of strong arguments against um, the extradition. There's a lot of mainstream support, so there are opportunities there. But I think we'll all be digging through the the comments here, and and would welcome your input because I'm sure you've got lots lots of suggestions. What effect do you think this attempt at prosecution will have on aspiring journalists and whistleblowers? I think um, I can't even begin to imagine really. Um, I think some people maybe now I think are, are falling for this. Um, there's a bit of a red herring around. Oh, uh, WikiLeaks was it was it really journalism or not? Maybe maybe it doesn't apply to me. Um, but that's not the point. They're, they're criminalizing the practice, so all journalists will be affected. Um, so I can't imagine how how it can't have the most enormous impact ever. And not just on, you know, what the US does around the world, but if, a, if the US can extradite an Australian citizen from the UK to the US, what does that mean? Like the Saudi can do that with a journalist in some country or Modi or Netanyahu, like where does it end? Mm -hmm. So I just can't imagine, I think, I, I, I can't even imagine what it's like. And I think it's, really fascinating if people want to sit this one out thinking like oh i'm at this like i'm a different category or something so you know i'd love to be wrong how high does the body count have to be before any western political figure is subject to the kind of heavy-handed legal treatment dished out to assange and the second question is British legal profession have been largely silent on the shameful events at Belmarsh. Why is there a lack of outrage by professionals at the scandal that is unfolding? I think there has been a bit of outrage. I mean, I hate to sound like Mary Poppins, like keep trying to sort of plug good news, but I think there was just the other day a big um, uh, letter that came out. There was a big jurist letter signed by, I forget how, you know, dozens or hundreds of jurists around the world. You know, there was a big doctor's letter with about 60 doctors from around the world um, saying that, you know, Julian could die at Belmarsh. You know, he's got chronic lung conditions from having been um, in confinement for so many years. So I think the sort of organizations, the you know, it's it's being covered, but it kind of needs to be amplified a lot more, I think. I think. But, you know, as others have, have said on this call, I think there's an effort to um, make things sound a lot more confusing than they are and, and make a lot of noise and, um, yeah, to, to, to make things just, you know, it's, it's, pr it's a pretty simple situation. You know, if you're looking at legally, um, this is clearly, you know, a political case. Um, Julian, we know, was spied on in the embassy. All the celebrities who went and met with him, everything was spied on. All the lawyers' meetings were um, spied on. Um, there's a Spanish legal case right now about the surveillance company that was hired to um, give all the surveillance materials of Julian's legal meetings. So that's a huge, huge breach of due process. Um, not to mention the fact that one of the points they're trying to use in this in this extradition is saying that there was huge damage done by the leaks but that's never been demonstrated even in courts in the US they, they've under oath the prosecution have said that there's actually no demonstrable damage in terms of loss of life or anything like that so you know the, the points of the case are, are fairly clear in a way um, and I think there is institutional support but um, whether that can sort of break through and and everyone can kind of get a little bit more um, activated, like folks on this call, um, remains to be seen. It's a, it's a difficult news cycle. Um, and, and there's been a, you know, an excellent job done in kind of trying to demonize him. Um, but, you know, uh, as, as many people have said, they, they obviously go for the person who seems like most controversial, like they weren't gonna go and do this against the New York Times or the Washington Post at this point, but that doesn't mean they won't. You know, we've just seen in the last few days um, uh, journalists blinded in the US on US streets by, by police and um, that's now sort of business as usual this sort of war on the press around the world so yeah. Uh, from the court proceedings it seems like that the outcome of this trial has already been determined and how can we do what can we do to resist this and a 
similar question. Um, what can he do as an American other than contacting the senators and congressmen to kind of support the campaign? And I guess that goes for British, the British people as well and activists as well, that other than lobbying, what can we do to, you know, support the campaign and uh, before, before, especially before the 7th of September? So I think these are the final two questions. Briefly, so the Don't Extradite uh, Assange website has a bunch of actions that can be done, um, you know, contacting MPs, petitions, all sorts of campaign actions. So I go there and, and see what's going on. There's a number of different um, campaigning groups around the world. There's a really good European ones, Australian ones, um, but I check out Don't Extradite Assange. Um, I would say you know, I don't think it's a done deal at all in the UK. Um, the hearing begins on September 7th at, in London, um, but then depending on what happens, um, there are various appeal procedures and then it can go to the European courts. So this could take a few years if Julian survives Belmarsh, which um, for those folks abroad, you know, is, is sometimes talked about a little bit like a British Guantanamo, you know, there are COVID cases, he's, um, you know, in really difficult um, prison situations there. Um, but I think um, Julian's partner Stella has said this, this, this needs to be resolved, you know, in UK, ideally, or in Europe, once it's gone to the US, God forbid, it's, it's, you know, it's, it's, it, but there it's more of a, excuse my language, a shit show. Um, but there's there's still a lot lot of time, not a lot, but there's some, some time pre-September 7th and then there are appeal processes. So that would be my two cents.